Hi, I'm Diane McGarry. Welcome to our September 2023 Arts Saturday Reading and Q&A with author Linda McCullough Moore. I'm Diane McGarry with Drake at Arts, and with me are co-host Tom McGarry, author Linda McCullough Moore, and ASL interpreter Judy. Linda is the author of two story collections, a novel, an essay collection, and hundreds of shorter published works. She is the winner of Pushcart Prize, as well as winner and finalist for numerous national awards. Her first story collection was endorsed by Alice Munro. And equally as joyous, she frequently hears from readers who write to say her works make a difference in their lives. For many years, she has mentored award-winning writers of fiction, poetry, and memoir. She is currently completing a novel, Time Out of Mind, and a collection of her poetry, each in search of a good theme and a good home. Linda, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And were you going to read us some of your new novel? I was so excited when you mentioned that. I was. I'm not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, be reading, I'll be reading shorter things today. Oh, cool. Right. I'm so looking forward to hearing your works. So would you like me to begin? Yeah, that would be great. All right. So I'll read for a bit and you can uh, stop me at any point. And I don't know how much this is to be a conversation or a reading. Um, so you let me know. Sure. That's actually a lot up to our audience. If anyone has um, questions or comments, please put them in the chat so that um, Linda can continue to flow with her story and we will bring them forward. Thank you. I have a little vibration on the screen from uh, one of our viewers. So I'm gonna need to do a little something fancy to um, see if I can cover that. Ah, good, done. All right. Um, so, I hesitate to call what I'm reading poetry. I, I think I'll call it um, things that I have written down. And uh, a lot of it was written during the pandemic. So that will be my excuse. And um, <laughs> I, I pray that God will your dear hearts. You're so kind to be here. <clears throat> Only the lonely. I read in the paper they're treating loneliness with Advil. You would have thought they might have treated it with other people, but the article says lonely people turn in on themselves, grow self-absorbed and fractious. It says if you put two lonely people together, they will hate each other in 10 minutes. So Advil then for the pain. I've read that anti-inflammatories eat the lining of the stomach. I like it that it's lined. Uh, and cause bleeding, which presumably is thought to be preferred to being lonely. Reading between the lines where everything is mostly written, it seems that scientists conflate loneliness and living alone. A lot of my friends live alone. It says here, it will kill them. I would have thought old age would do that. I'm no expert, unless of course, living 40 years off and on alone says, yes, I am. But I know there's more to loneliness than being by yourself. I knew it in the second grade. Type two, adult onset, felt most keenly when in isolation. Type one begins the first time a child finds himself in company. Isolation, it makes other people nervous. Puritans in Plymouth, Massachusetts gave the newly widowed 90 days to find new digs. It was against the law of God, presumably, 
to live alone. It is not good for man to be alone, God, perhaps. All I can say for certain is that loneliness has not much to do with housing. Loneliness is something else, more like a microscope, a telescope, a thing you see the world through. Some days it lets you take life out of the box and finger feel its edges, let it catch the light. Some days it lets you feel the preciousness of other people. What faith? Disbelief is not the same as not believing. Disbelief makes noises, guffaws, sends Christians witty puns, the bread of life is risen, LOL, that sort of thing. Disbelief needs company, goes crazy after just one Saturday of quarantine smokes Mary Jane for eye health and inspiration. Not believing loves the isolation, says we're all good people, bottles up the milk of human kindness, trumpets quietude, makes charity a thing. And at the cross of Jesus, not believing shakes her head. She disapproves entirely. Disbelief says, this is crazy. But standing by the empty tomb, he's the one who sticks his head inside, calls out, is anybody home? He it is who registers the echo. Debate, February 21, 1965. I flew the first time from Buffalo to New York City for a college debate. Resolved, the US government shall establish a program of public works for the unemployed. I was pro, I'm almost certain. In those days, you scribbled notes while your opponent built his arguments from three by five cards and statistics, ideally recent and correct. In those days, they gave out mini packs of cigarettes with lunch on airplanes, cigarettes that we, the unpracticed, puffed and coughed and sputtered at, inhaling in our Bronx hotel. In those days, the stewardess would come on mid-flight to say that Malcolm X had just been shot and we'd be landing in 11 minutes. I didn't know who Malcolm X was or really whether public works would be a good idea. I knew I liked debate, rule-laden orchestrate. I knew I liked to fly and Malcolm X was somebody. I knew there must be more to cigarettes once a person got the hang of smoking. These are incredible poems, Linda. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, this one uh, was inspired by a lot of medieval paintings of knights in armor jousting with snails. One of the we call them little sins. Flipping through old photographs, selfies, I don't know, pasted in the Middle Ages in those inner pages of the history of the world, I find more than a few worn, tatty, but tale-telling depictions of paint-faded knights engaged in fights with shelled, round, curly foes. The knights, most thin, steel-covered, chain-mailed, helmeted and mounted, in earnest combat with ringletted snails, scrolled, whirled, mollusk, gastropode. 
semi-slug, a distant cousin of the octopus, already to touche. It's said to be mysterious swords drawn on shell delectables, although I don't see why. It is the minuscule, the pesky, we duel with every day. Bring big guns to the fray and brandish rusty weapons, cuss like sailors do. Clanking metal, making noise, though through every joust, the house still betting on sale. <laughs> wow. Someone has asked if you could pause a little bit more between each poem because they're so incredible and so different. Would I wonder if you would want to speak about any of them, Linda? Um, I'm still caught up in the loneliness poem, quite honestly. <laughs> so it's a lot. I mean, it's wonderful. It's great to hear you. I, I don't know how much you want to talk about any of what you've written. Um, I would say I would say roughly not at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, at this point, I'm happy to let them. Uh, I'm just sending them out to speak for themselves. Thank you. I pray I often do. Dear God, might you please, in this holy season, give me something satisfying, lovely, good, and true that it might serve a substitute for you. Those whom God has joined together. The coffee shop, the morning quiet, the scattering of patrons, sleep winked, scrubbed and soap shine, spruced and ready, spaced to catch the light. We are come together so that we can be alone. We the backdrop, marital status ringed display. <laughs> Sit interspersed with a matchmaker, a mail order parson, and a duo very married far too long. The matchmaker, capped out in, camped out in her corner, interviews a hopeful man. What would you say is your worst quality? She starts to write before he can begin to answer. The parson who officiates, he has a sliding scale, also a tux, a flautist, but that's extra. Preps the to-be bride and groom. I like to mention divorce statistics before the vows, he says. The bride beams, oblivious, it's how we wed. The groom checks his phone. Nearby, two old married sit sipping, sullen, silent, staring out at graying snow. They haven't spoken since Columbus Day. They're saving up. The matchmaker says, if a woman totally repulses you in every way, don't date her. The man writes it down. The youngsters ask the minister, how many weddings has he done? It's what you ask your surgeon. The old woman burps, the old man reaches for the sugar. We are all so different. The svelte barista, the ponchy owner, every patron in the place. And we all, every single one of us are so alike. The only thing we ever really wanted to get this one thing right. Thank 
That's such a beautiful poem. Hairnet. Doran's hair was netted in a bailing cap like thatch under wire. Shirley Hazard. The package came today, the Book of English Oddities. <coughs> it wrote itself. Some dental floss, my eye drops, and a salt and pepper wig, which adds three inches to my height and at least five years to my age. I shake the plastic bag it came in, which I am advised to refrain from putting over my head. Out falls a hairnet. A hairnet I toss in recycling, then fish out, and arrange with some remembered care atop my frizzy hair. From the front, I look like one grandmother, from the side, the other one. And in the three-way mirror, it is 1950, hair nuts everywhere. I think it was against the law to sleep without one and every waitress everywhere even in the five and 10, wore one all day. A flimsy thing, weightless as advertised, but strong and long lasting, bearing any run in with a bobby pin. On your head, a helmet. There has not been a wind blown anywhere to best it. It holds not just your hair, but keeps your thoughts contained and reins in frizzy inclinations. And oh, the thing is truly strong. So very like those women, holding everything in place, sometimes hard to see. I'll read one more and then maybe we can um, chat a bit. Fair warning. There's a pond at the edge of campus and it's evening there and cold for April. Cold always for this or cold for that. Three sit on a bench, two more on a swing and six or seven on a blanket on what must surely be iced ground. Young women without a clue. You, you will grow old, I want to call out to them. There, there's a fire behind the sky tonight. You will grow old if you are lucky, if you are very lucky. Not, not tonight or tomorrow, but so soon. A single young woman passes by. There is a fire behind the sky tonight, I tell her. It's all right, she says, everything will be all right. It's what they think, every one of them. It's what I thought. Wow. You have a lot of depth of interpretation and insights into the people you're talking about. It's very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. And like Bill, <laughs> I got hung up a little bit on the loneliness poem that you read first. That was so... I have 20 other poems on loneliness, so I couldn't pick them out. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Such great descriptions of how it felt and feels and you know, and other people imposing their ideas of what loneliness really is, which isn't necessarily loneliness at all. It's so perceptive. Tom, you need to unmute, sweetheart. So I am an introvert. I like to be alone part of the time. So your first poem really spoke to me because <laughs> uh, in the presence of others, uh, well, sometimes I feel a pressure to do things. And when I'm alone, I don't feel that pressure. So I need that part of the time. 
So that's not the same as loneliness. So anyway, thank you for that, Paul. It really spoke to me. And I like the way you talked about the different couples. Libby picked up on the marrieds saving up. <laughs> mm. When you viewed everyone and, and you really got the essence of each different age. It was lovely. I did laugh out loud at that part, I gotta yeah. say. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does anyone else want to offer any comments? Either unmute yourself or put it in the chat. That would be fine either way. Yeah, I do have a question. Linda, it was just incredible to hear your voice and to, to hear your work. Um, what um, I understand that you're calling these a these poems is that right well not necessarily they seem less poem like the more I practiced reading them so um they are what they are I don't know I uh I just felt that they were so completely full and stood so beautifully by themselves each one as a story almost and i was uh curious about just the the distinction if any you made between a poem and short prose but it doesn't sound like we need to go there just thank you so much for reading well i think it's a really interesting question and one i think about a lot because my day job for the last 30 some years has been writing short stories. So mm -hmm. that's clearly my bailiwick. And I think that a lot of the things, the shorter things that I write with line breaks, whatever you call them, um, are narrative very often. And I also observed that when I was looking for things to read, a lot of them center around an overheard comment, someone saying something that I find a little quirky and interesting. So you're uh, still eavesdropping on um, people at cafes. <laughs> yeah, and and in my neighborhood, I think I have one here about, I have a few actually about neighbors, yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. But I think it I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, in in fact, it occurred to me, would I publish any of these at in paragraph form, calling them either short fiction, which I no, I wouldn't be comfortable doing that, but just calling them um, I would call them nonfiction for the most part. So little little think pieces. Isn't also part of the difference between poetry and prose the way it's presented to people? Like you have the lines laid out in with different space in between or different um, parts of each sentence on a line so that you visually stop as you're going through and you can hold the images longer in your head in a different way. I, I maybe tend to think that if done properly and I'm looking around this crowd and seeing a few faces who do properly, that when poetry is written, um, it doesn't matter how it's printed, that poetry is a different animal. I really think that poetry is something, is something very different from prose, um, th that they're not at all the same. Uh, in much the way I would distinguish between a short story and a short nonfiction piece. Mm -hmm. Well, let me read a bit more um, with your forbearance. Oh, of course. Someone asked for the loneliness poem again. Um, Bill, we were, we're recording this, so you can come back and listen to it after probably Monday or Tuesday. We'll send you the link where they're uploaded. And um, someone asked you about flash fiction. Yeah, flash fiction, I know nothing about. <laughs> At all. 
I could make something up, but it wouldn't be very interesting. Uh, this poem is called, It's the Real Thing. I read in the local paper on the op-ed page this morning that all the stories in the Bible are metaphor, no less, no more. The writer said a person didn't need to be a friggin' theologian to know that. I looked up friggin' in the OED. It said the word was rude, poor cousin of one ruder. And then I opened up the book opined about so brusquely and read of scruffy fishermen camped on a beach at breakfast time and eating fish served by a man so lately crucified, quite newly risen from the dead. Those fishermen, too blind to see the man for metaphor, too hungry, having worked all night not catching a damn thing to recognize the fish as simile. But I don't know, a person likes to credit kindly what you read in the paper. Words written by a man who does not know himself more surely more than just an emblem of a kind of disappointment i will not have him be the metaphor he at first meeting begs to be a silly symbol of ephemeral cheek not when there's fresh sea salmon baking on the coals this host and wine and bread all this, a day ahead, to last beyond explaining. I remember the world. I step out on the porch to hear the woman's voice next door. Daddy's home, she calls out, that line drawn across the bottom of the afternoon, the done and undone at an end. And even though September, it will seem still a good idea to yell the children in, wash and carry dinner things outside. It's that or candles in the dining room and manners, napkins, prayers, where there is just tonight before the world ends, before the boys be men gone far away. Daddy's home, she calls out as though it were some common thing to say, ho hum to herald fireflies, chatter, storybooks before the darkness comes as though it were some ordinary thing to welcome nighttime on its way. Contemplation. I go for a walk to think about God. It's different from praying. It's different from anything. It's impossible. He's too big, too old. Did Abraham and Moses think of him? It doesn't say. Does he weary of the world? I would. My friend prays, dear God, I know that you can hear me. Like a mother to her teenage daughter on her cell phone. I write to him notes in a leather journal. I write him letters I don't send. Does he read his mail? I walk down to the river, so many dogs today. God made them. I wonder if he thinks he overdid it. It's hard to think of God. Some days so far away, some days so close I hear him sigh that one time laugh, and just once cry. Mm -hmm. 
rights of ownership. I go to Pennsylvania, that other commonwealth, not my first trip, but um, nearing now my last, to move my mother to perpetual care where it is intended she will live until she doesn't anymore. We don't say so out loud, or if we do, we say from now on. Old age of a field of stubble sprouting euphemisms thick on the ground, the litter of a language that has grown unwieldy, unspeakable, word I want to say. I tell my next door neighbor I'll be gone eight days as many nights. I'm making small talk. I don't know that it will be more like a hundred thousand to me. To my neighbor, eight. Eight days she will spend, and God alone knows why, unearthing bushes, flowers, long-lived weeds and grasses, all some shade of green, if crabby from my yard, where she will plant a tiny field of mulch, copper colored to my eye, fluorescent in strong light. I like mulch in front of savings banks and public toilets. In my yard, she will have planted mums. Mum is the word, so many I can't count. We called my mother mummy. My sibs now call her mum. I will come home in eight days, home to my home, spent. My mother having been transported from the house where she has lived for seven decades in succession to a room the size of the mulch pad my neighbor has so curiously installed in my front yard. I'm telling you about control. I'm saying messing with a thing that isn't yours, a garden or somebody's life, it's tricky. So I don't know if you would like to um, have a little respite <laughs> or uh, if I should continue. What say you, audience? Um, the insightfulness you gave to caring for someone as well as someone else trespassing on your space. It's very, it's something we often don't think of with the elderly. And what does elderly even mean? <laughs> I'm beginning to find out. I know, I know. I, me as well. And it's it's from perception that other people have of us, right? Not necessarily the reality of who or how we are. It's very interesting. Uh, Virginia said, you're allowing us to be in company with the private thoughts we so often have of others. It's a fascinating experience. And Libby laughed out loud for God overdoing it on the dogs. <laughs> <clears throat> Are there any other comments or thoughts? I will read you my interpretation of um, a Bible story. It's called Garden of Eden. The serpent, snake when he's at home, devil of a guy, slender, slim, nice suit, good haircut, selling pomegranates door to door. 
a Jesuit, a Pharisee. His mother said he'd make a lawyer. He doesn't ask the woman, are you hungry? Do you like to try new things? The devil asks Eve, do you believe he loves you? Up, down, yes, no, not sure, can't tell, absolutely. Define your terms. The little boy, he loves his goldfish, scoops him from the bowl and puts him on the rug to play. He wants the goldfish to be free. Nothing he'll say no to. Do you believe he loves you? Oral argument. If he did, would he say no to you? Love is never having to say, don't eat that. It doesn't take a chasm to wean a soul away. A fracture crack will do an old priest who tells young men how doubt is really a good thing. A snake who comes around when Adam is at work. He asks again. The maiden, let's call her that, Crinkles up her eyes, snake charmer, charming. He's not unattractive, devil's often not. So ask, when does it start? Are we to date the fall of man from the first bite or from its contemplation? Let the record show when does the sin begin? The question, still an echo on that morning, do you believe he loves you? Eve bows her head, looks up again. Honestly, she says, not the way I want. This one is called Ebola. We never touch anyone. He's the German doctor there where doctors die because they touch a patient's sleeve. There where brothers and sisters, aunts and cousins break into the hospitals and steal infected sisters, brothers, nieces, nephews who are already stolen from their beds at home. Do they have mattresses? I do not know. I don't know what they have except Ebola. They can still spread when they are dead if someone touches them. It always will come down to that. The lady on the radio says it's because Sierra Leoneans are illiterate that they rescue their dear ones from hospitals, steal the stolen, take them home again. And people who can read and write leave her. The Lord God domestical. We have him whittled thin to splinter kin, bent hollow tin to make of him a trinket carried in a pocket we can rub for sanguine luck. And then, just as witless, do declaim in frank surprise his being useless in a fight. Pandemic, home alone. I miss the kisses, skilled in their receiving, not believing hardly I will ever kiss again. 
I've not been to the supermarket in a hundred weeks. I do not like my chances. I miss a sides dipped acerbic, smart, ironic, being teased. I miss laughing till I cry. I miss crying. Those rare tears barely shed held in the eye. Rare, barely shared, but remembered out loud in the stories I will tell. Being held and holding. Yes, I miss and smiles. A captive audience for all my smart opinions. And I miss the arguments. I compliment my neighbor overheard in one slick presentation, his patently position with no merit. I tell him he's lucky to have a spouse to argue with. I'm forced to argue with myself, I say, and hoist the garden hose. I never win. You can come argue with us anytime, he tells me. He's not much of a debater, but he does have a good heart. You know where you are in an argument, how you feel about a thing, the trunk or the roof rack. You not only know which, but why, and who's ideally suited to decide. So shall I wish, wish again for kisses or for robust wrangling come the efficacious vaccine? The two together, I think, coupled in my view in that way, not entirely unlike prayer. Love one another. My old boyfriend, old, former, old, 76-ish. Boyfriend, heartthrob, boyfriend, wed, near miss. Calls me now and then. I call him. He tells me what he's reading. I try to tease or reminisce. He tells me of a new woman he cooks for once a week. She cooks for him. Soups involving cauliflower, heavy cream, carrot cake if memory serves. It seems they watch TV. Is anyone in love with anyone I say? What difference would that make? His question posed and reposed, re repositioned it remains the same. I was in love with you, I say. What difference did it make, he wants. I can't think what to say, but, but there are surely things that should be said, things I'm almost certain we both know. It's only at the moment we two neither one can quite say what they are. Love one another, Jesus neglecting to say just how that might be done. So I will take a little reading break. Mm -hmm. 
Beth said that these poems and pieces are shattering, especially love one another. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, the word. These poems and pieces are shattering, especially love one another, which is um, Teresa's favorite. And you point to sadness in love and the humor of love. And also the humor of loneliness and sadness. You're wonderful at finding that. Well, I think the kind of humor that appeals to me the most is humor that's deeply interwoven with um, whatever is terrible. You know, yeah. I I just <laughs> I just find that coupling very winsome. Uh, you're reminding me of something my daughter said to me recently which is you can either cry or laugh in different situations and we have a choice as to how we respond well i think it's really sweet when the two come together mm -hmm. sort of a package deal yes <laughs> yes Libby likes when you said, love is never having to say, don't eat that. <laughs> Which is priceless because that moment comes up so often, yes? Just being able to let go of the controlling parenting. Bill would like to know how you would package these, if you have any ideas of how you would package these. I'm just glad you're reading them all to us because they're so incredibly wonderful. Uh, package in what sense? I mean, <laughs> there is some disorder, so I have more than a passing interest in that. Uh, I remember a friend saying to me years ago, um, Marilyn Robinson lived for a, quite a while on Massasoit Street in Northampton across from the Y. And she collected tin cans. And not casually, she was a serious collector, floor to ceiling, stacks of tin cans. Oh, wow. um, and which is the only thing you know if you share a town with somebody. Um, and I was telling my friend about it and she said, well, it's housekeeping, you know, because that was the title of her first novel. She said, it's really all about housekeeping. And she characterized my work as housekeeping. Huh. Um, she said, you sort of take things and order them in some way or find a cupboard to put them in, or a drawer, or I, I don't know, just just packaging in that sense. But I don't know, I don't know in terms of, they, they seem so disparate to me, I can't imagine putting them all together in the same place. And I'd be interested what anyone thought about that. Um, I have a thought about that. It seems like it's not really about theme at all. It's about the structure and you're very consistent in your form with each of these. Um, so they seem to me to fit very, very well. And they also feel very much like um, I get to look in, it's like I'm on the outside looking into a lit house and you're at your dining room table doing something very intimate eating, you know, or having tea and just writing in your diary or something. And I'm, I'm a voyeur. Um, that makes me cry, Beth. That's so beautiful. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, a, what a wonderful thing to say. That just, that mm -hmm. just delights me. That's just so wonderful. So because I think that all of us 
have a deep desire to be known, a very deep desire to be known. And how the heck do we do that? Because we go around all day talking about packaging. We go around all day presenting ourselves in order not to be known. So that, and I, I think that that's one of the big blessings of writing in a life is that the, there are avenues where you can be known a little bit. And I think that I've always considered myself a very private person who tells all my secrets to everyone I meet. But um, my first novel even was, was all about me and what I think and how I feel. And so I think there's a, a really strong impulse to, to be known. Uh, well, I, I wanted to respond to that to the keeping part of housekeeping, because it's it's so lovely what I experience is that nothing is being thrown away, that things are being examined and treasured and polished. And it's a little bit like having family silver, that things get tarnished, but they're still there. They still are capable of, of glowing and having meaning for us if we take the time to yeah. take care of them. Yeah. And I feel yeah. as if that's, that's what you're doing in part that's so beautifully put for Virginia Wonderful. um I think oh, I would like to you. read one more poem and um yeah I would so let me just read this one if you will mm -hmm. you like a person you can talk to first off I have 50 years on Sam I am famous for my migraines. Sam calls me to see if he's having one. First timers always ask, always want to rule out broken brains, mad cow disease and personality transplant. I tell Sam, yes, he does. I say, elevate your blood sugar, chug caffeine, take a leave, wear dark glasses, don't sleep in, eat your neck. I tell him to avoid contrasting colors, light noise, onions, HGs, and aggravation, also other people. He says, okay. We discuss the pandemic. I tell him certain Christians say it's like the year of Jubilee. Sam's trying to be more Jewish. I'm trying to be more Christian. We meet up in Isaiah. The last year of Jubilee was 121 BC. We say we're probably due. The year, debts forgiven, slaves set free, the whole world starting up over as designed to be. This is what we talk about. I've always thought I say that God was miffed with me, like he saw me like my sister does. The last few days, I've started to wonder what if instead he loves me like, like my dad who held my hand and took me for long walks after supper and for years called me Jane Eyre? Is it an idea or a feeling, Sam says. This is why he is the one I talk to. I tell him I don't know. We hang up. I text Sam a link for migraine music that will settle down his brain. I take his question to the kitchen, put the coffee on. Is it an idea or a feeling? But how could love be an idea? And I should say that I probably have a poem written to most of you on the screen. <laughs> I, I actually, there's one person on the screen that I promised years ago that I would never write about. And I think I may have signed an agreement to that effect because I do tend to hold forth. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's really exciting to see the faces on the screen because there are so many wonderful poets here that it's it's really an honor to be able to share work with people who who actually know how to write. It's just really nice. It's really nice. Yeah. 
Mary Beth said, I love how much you reflect on God. So many of these could be prayers, prayers as poems, poems as prayers. And I guess I do think of a lot of what I write, whether it's this sort of thing or fiction or nonfiction, as as part of ongoing conversations with God. Uh, I sort of conceptualize that kind of meditation um, also. Well, I in particular have considered this a type of love feast of all the workings and your insights into people and the insights into yourself that you've given us. There's a lot of wisdom in your writing. Um, and it's just been very, thank you for this gift. Thank you very much for this gift. And I do want to acknowledge my dear friend, Vera, who is with us today. Vera is, um, a, a budding poet. Uh, I am tutoring Vera in English. Uh, Vera is in Ukraine and uh, she's learning English. And so I said, oh, I know what we'll do first. You can write poetry in English. <laughs> and she's done it. She's wonderful. Oh. So I'm so very pleased that she's with us today and keep an eye out for her poetry. I will definitely, definitely do that. Thank you all for being here. This has been wonderful. And this reading, along with all of today's Art Saturday events, will be available on the Drake at Arts YouTube channel starting Monday. For more information about this and our other programs or to become a sponsor, please go to drakeatarts.com or email us at drakeatarts at gmail.com. We'd like to take a moment to thank our many sponsors for making this program possible. Amy Lamb, Shelley Payson, Robin Rubendunst, Susan Belkin, Helen Fremont, Caroline Scott, Philip Thibault, Lois Wilbur, Anita Bangliese, Mary Ann Dornice Goldman, Galena Sakes, the Massachusetts Cultural Council Festival and Programs Grants, and the grants from the Dracut, Concord, North Reading, Westford, Wilmington Cultural Councils, local agencies which are supported by the Massachusetts, Massachusetts Cultural Council, a state agency. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. And any of your poets, please send us your works. We would love to have more of you on our upcoming programs. <laughs>